Hi, and welcome to our second episode of the series Interesting History. Today's topic, the Great Trek. Now most of you probably have no idea what the Great Trek even is, so let's clear you up straight away. The Great Trek was a large-scale migration of Dutch-speaking colonists living on the South African Cape into the wild South African hinterland in large numbers for a variety of different reasons. Not only did this migration have a massive effect on the cultural landscape of Africa, it also played an important role in and after the South African apartheid state, and therefore many monuments dedicated to it, built during the apartheid regime, have been the victim of lots of controversy in the modern-day South African Republic. By the way, we are aware that some of you may be surprised or confused about seeing a video about South African history right after seeing our first video on the Finnish Winter War, but as far as I know, there's no connection between the two. But if you can find a correlation between the two, we invite you to write down your crazy theories in the comment section. So we're just going to do a lot of jumping back and forth through, through history on this series, so I guess you're just going to have to get used to it. So back to the Great Trek. Like in all things, in order to understand this historical phenomenon, you have to take a look at the events that caused it. And that leads us back to 17th century Netherlands. There, a new form of business had been established, in today's society known by the little known word of capitalism. And one company in particular profited a lot through this new business method, the Vereinigte Ost Industrie Company, the VOC. In English, the Dutch East India Company. Now with the help of the money it had amassed throughout the 17th century, the company decided to establish a supply stop on the southern tip of Africa, halfway between the VOC's colonies in Indonesia, where it got all of its expensive materials and spices from, and its homeland of the Netherlands. Up until then, you see, up to half of all sailors on ships traveling along this treacherous 14,000 mile long journey would die, mostly because of a disease called scurvy, which stems from a vitamin C deficiency. And believe it or not, it was kind of hard to find sources for vitamin C like fresh fruits and vegetables on a ship that hasn't seen land in the last three months. So basically having a colony in the form of a supply stop on the extremely fertile soil on the Cape of Good Hope of South Africa served as a countermeasure to the high death toll of the company's ships. The settlers of the colony would receive free land and protection, but in return they would have to give a share of each season's harvest to company officials, who would then redistribute the supplies to ships passing by. So from when the colony was first established in 1652 to the late 18th century, the white, overwhelmingly Dutch-speaking population had grown to around 15,000, the majority still working as farmers in the primarily agriculture-based colony. However, by now many were displeased by the high share of the crops the VOC demanded, and many poor inhabitants of the colony tried to escape the authoritarian rule by moving further inland, away from the original settlement at Marunen, Cape Town, and into lands where the indigenous tribe of the Kwokoi settled, and therefore was forced to flee due to the superior firearms that the Dutch possessed. This was the first of many times the Dutch farmers used the strategy of simply packing up their things and going somewhere else when they thought that they were being treated unfairly. Fun fact! The Berlin Wall was actually not the first time in history an obstacle was designed for the sole purpose of keeping the own population in, rather than others out. The Dutch East India Company actually attempted to build a large fence around their settlement at the Cape in order to keep the poor unhappy farmers in, and so would be able to keep collecting shares of their crops. By 1800 though, the VOC was plagued by corruption which inevitably led to its decline and bankruptcy in 1799. The United Kingdom immediately recognized the opportunity this posed for them, since the colony lay at such a strategically important position, and so the British proceeded to seize the colony only facing minor resistance while doing so. The local Dutch inhabitants, optimistic at first, were hoping that the British would keep out of issues concerning the local population and would only have a minor military presence and nothing else. However, as they quickly noticed, it was not going to go as hoped. The British quickly continued to establish a colonial authority in the now British Cape Colony. This new authority immediately introduced laws that treated the Dutch-speaking population much worse than the growing number of British immigrants, which had started coming into the region now. All of this was part of the British government's plan to Britannize the region and stabilize their hegemony in southern Africa. These new policies made the local Dutch population very mad, as you could guess. But that's not even all of what Britain did. The final straw came in the late 1820s and early 1830s when Britain, in a phase of sudden and wild humanitarianism, decided to impose laws throughout its colonies which foresaw a gradual end to slavery and a definite end to all involuntary servitude by 1838. The Dutch farmers, to some also known as the Boers, relied on cheap slave labor in order to maintain their, in some instances, lavish lifestyle, and now, as you can guess, were even more angered than they had been before. 
And so, they used the same solution that they had used to escape the VOC, to go further inland. This time, however, it was migration on a massive scale, well, for 19th century South Africa anyways. More than 6,000 Dutch farmers, approximately 10% of the entire white population of the region at the time, left their farms in the Cape Colony and ventured out into the unknown of Southern Africa in search for a place where they could continue to practice their ways of discrimination and poor treatment of the native population and slaves, free of British surveillance. Knowing that most of the land north of their original settlements was occupied by the dry and hostile Kalahari Desert, most farmers moved either to the ostensibly fertile regions of the east or northeast. The farmers who were audacious enough to participate in these adventurous migrations started calling themselves trekkers. Trek actually just means wander in English, so the great trek is actually just the great wandering. Interestingly, most trekkers traveled in either long caravans of Dodge pickup trucks or black suburbans. Just kidding! Most actually traveled in something similar to the contemporary version of a mobile home, also known as a wagon pulled by oxen. So in general, you can say that there are two main trekker groups, a smaller one that went to the east through the Drakensberg mountain region on their way to the fertile land of the Zulu kingdom, and another slightly larger one which didn't leave the Cape Colony until a few years later in 1840. The first group that chose the pass through the mountainous area had quite a few encounters with local tribes, most notably the Zulu, of course. Unlike other African tribes who simply signed the rights to their land off to the trekkers since they were afraid of their superior firearms, the Zulu, who had recently gained an influence and power due to their most prominent leader, Shaka Zulu, did not comply with the trekker demands. In fact, on one occasion, a Zulu MP army massacred a party of 282 Boer settlers, including 185 children. The trekkers, outraged, of course, proceeded to retaliate by raiding many Zulu villages. The end to this conflict came with the Battle of Blood River, where a force of 480 trekkers confronted a Zulu MP which consisted of roughly 12,000 Zulu soldiers. Now, as the name suggests, the result of the battle was quite bloody, and as just like most conflicts between Europeans and native kingdoms and tribes during the age of colonization, this one too was won by the Europeans, the trekkers. The Zulu, armed with mere spears and oxide shields, did not stand a chance against the superior equipped boars. And when the day was over, the Zulus had over 3,000 dead, compared to only three wounded on the Trekker side. This, of course, had a devastating effect on the Zulu, and soon after, the tribal empire fell into a civil war, partly due to the instability that the defeat of the Battle of Blood River had caused. Additionally, the Boers had now secured their dominance in the region, and therefore had free reign there. Ah, <clears throat> no, not that kind of Boers. God. Okay, that's better. So in 1839, the Trekkers decided to create a new state, the first white European independent state in Africa. The nascent country was named the Natalia Republic, with the capital in the city of Peter Maritzburg. Sadly enough, though, the nation was annexed by Britain in 1843, since they were afraid the Boers could threaten British control or the strategically important trade routes around the South African coastline. And again, many Boers packed up their belongings and migrated further north, this time across the Vaal River in northeastern South Africa. And this is where their paths met up again with the part of the second group of trekkers who, instead of traveling east through the Drakensberg, had ventured to the northeast, into the land across the Orange River. These trekkers had experienced much less contact with the indigenous population, since much of the region there, across the Orange River, had been pillaged by Zulu forces during the aforementioned Zulu expansion, and as such, large population groups had fled to the north and the west. Now, after seeing that the trekkers in Natal had been successful in creating an independent republic at first, the idea of a free trekker state had been ensconced in the Boers' minds. Before, you see, their only goal had been fleeing the British. In addition to this new common goal of self-governance, the Boers had been developing new, unique traditions during the isolation of the Great Trek. All of this eventually compounded in the creation of the Afrikaner identity and culture, a culture that remained present throughout South African history, up until today even, where it especially has been subjected to much criticism, since, well, that was the culture that spread the idea of apartheid and segregation throughout the 20th century. So one could say that by 1850, the Boers living on the other side of the Orange River had developed a strong will to be independent. However, the British government, after seeing the success of annexing Natal, thought they could use the same strategy against the other group of trekkers. So up until 1852, the British refused to accept any Boer independence, claiming that they were still technically British citizens, and therefore had rightfully claimed the land for Britain. The British governor of the Cape Colony even created a small local British council in the region. However, it was soon clear that this authority proved highly inefficient. The whole situation was just extremely convoluted, and so the British really had no jurisdiction over the Boers across the Orange River. Finally, in 1854, the British acknowledged the sovereignty of the two new Boer states, the Orange Free State and Transvaal, 
with the signing of the Sand River Convention. In addition to trying to exert control over Boer lands, the British also attempted to halt Boer settlement of new lands, again afraid of losing control over vital trade routes, this time through South Central Africa, where valuable materials such as ivory were being transported. One way Britain thought it could achieve an end to continued trekker expansion was by forging strong alliances with local African tribal leaders and acknowledging their independence, as well as arming them with weapons with which they could fight the settlers. One of these tribal leaders was the king of the Bizuto tribe, Adam Koch III. He and the rest of his people settled in and around the area of the Drakensberg mountain range. Ever wondered why there's a country smack in the middle of South Africa called Lesotho? Well, interestingly enough, this is one instance where the British actually honored their alliance with the African tribal leader. The Bizuto, who had been guaranteed sovereignty by the British, remained independent for long after the Great Trek, and even after the fall of the Boer Republics in the early 20th century, in form of the country called Bazutoland, which was later renamed to Lesotho. Now at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that the Great Trek was an intrinsic part of Afrikaner culture during the Afrikaner South African apartheid state of the second half of the 20th century. Many descendants of Boers took great pride in their ancestors' feats, and festivals celebrating and commemorating the Great Trek were common in the segregationist state. Nowadays, however, in the free South African society, these celebrations are often perceived as white nationalism and therefore are very controversial and have thus been the origin of many altercations on the modern-day South African political scene. These altercations have also spurred animosity between white and colored people in South Africa and therefore have destroyed a sense of unity within the nation. So now a quick recap of the effects that the Great Trek had. Firstly, after the crippling battles that the Zulu fought against with the Boers, the whole empire entered a gradual state of decline. And finally, in 1887, the small remnants of it were incorporated into the growing British South Africa. On another note, the Trekkers were the first to put Britain's hegemony as a dominant influence in Southern Africa into question. Later on, this also encouraged the British Empire to pursue a more expansionist policy in the region. The small landlocked country of Lesotho was also an indirect product of the Great Trek and Britain's measures to encumber it. Probably the most important result of the Great Trek, however, was the creation of the Afrikaner culture. This new trekker identity also led to the establishment of the two Boer states of the Orange Free State in Transvaal in northeastern South Africa. But more on that in our next episode. Thank you for watching Intercity. If you enjoyed our video, please leave a like, subscribe, watch it again, and um, yeah, join us next time on our video about the Boer Republics, the sequel to this episode.